Well, uh, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 26th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in 2024. Uh, the first agenda item uh, for the committee to consider is uh, whether or not to take agenda items three and four this morning in private. Are we all agreed? Yeah, agreed. We are agreed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and our uh, main item of business uh, this morning is a further consideration of the Auditor General for Scotland and Accounts Commission joint report on tackling digital exclusion. Uh, and I'm pleased to welcome our witnesses uh, to the committee this morning. Uh, we're joined by uh, Leslie Fraser, who's the Director General Corporate. Uh, alongside Leslie Fraser is Jeff Huggins, who is the Chief Digital Officer in the Scottish Government. Uh, and Ailey McLaughlin is also here, who's the Deputy Director, Digital Ethics, Inclusion and Assurance uh, in the Scottish Government. Uh, and uh, finally, we are joined by Martin Wallace. Uh, uh, Martin is the Chief Digital Officer uh, in the Local Government Digital Office uh, at the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. Um, there are no opening statements, so I'm going to uh, start uh, with the questions. Uh, and my first question, which I'll direct first of all to you, Leslie Fraser, is do you accept the findings and the recommendations of the Auditor General uh, Accounts Commission report on tackling digital exclusion? Yes, we do. I think we um, think this is a very timely and helpful uh, report, um, shining a, a spotlight on a, a, a critically important <laughs> issue um, for um, government and for everyone providing public services. Um, we do um, absolutely acknowledge that um, having access to digital government digital public services is a necessity uh, for the people of Scotland and you know it's so important whether um, it is accessing you know certain public services in Social Security Scotland for example um, whether that's um, um, you know getting access to employment and um, that's uh, also a, a, you know a, an increasingly important area um, it's also important in being able to access, you know, good value services um, and products as well. Um, so there's a whole set of reasons why um, we think that um, tackling digital exclusion um, is important. And, and I think uh, the report is very helpful in highlighting areas um, where uh, government, along with our partners, um, can really focus and make the, the biggest um, impact on that. Okay, so uh, does that mean then that you accept the criticism from the Auditor General that leadership has weakened and momentum has slowed since the COVID-19 pandemic? I think it's fair to say that the COVID pandemic was an enormous shock to the system and I'm really proud of the work that colleagues did at that time to respond um, and really to um, transform access for people who were very vulnerable because of the unique circumstances um, of the pandemic. That, um, I, as in many areas of, of government and public service, the consequences of that time, I think, are still um, you know, issues that we are working with very actively and really trying to work out now um, what is going to be the um, most important um, ways in which we can tackle digital exclusion in a sustainable um, way that, that really tackles this and Im makes improvements for the long term. And um, so I, I don't think that there's been any lack of focus or leadership on this, but I do think we are in that rebuilding and refocusing uh, phase. And um, a lot of important work, of course, has gone on through that period as well, not least uh, the work that we've been doing to roll out connectivity. Um, across Scotland, without which, you know, no no access to digital services is possible. Um, but the way in which we can um, support um, people um, who are affected because they don't have access to devices or need the skills, you, you know, those are areas where we're very actively working with the third sector, our colleagues in local government, and indeed the private sector to establish what the um, best and most sustainable way of really making that impact will be in this new normal. Okay, I mean, you describe COVID-19 as a shock to the system. And as I read the Auditor General Accounts Commission report, uh, I think they are saying it was a shock to the system mm -hmm. and it jolted the government into action. 
and uh, it took some steps to try to tackle digital exclusion. But what's happened since the pandemic is that those efforts seem to have uh, lost momentum, slowed down, and in the words of the Auditor General, leadership has weakened. I don't think I would accept that. I mean, I might be bringing... Sorry, I thought you said earlier on you've well, accepted the recommendations and the we, findings. We, we do accept the recommendations and the general um, points that the um, Auditor General is, is helpfully making. Um, and there are aspects of this which are, are quite complex to uh, design in a, a sustainable, citizen-centred way at this point. But there has been a real focus on getting the foundations right here. I'll maybe ask Jeff to say a bit about the work that's been going on on digital connectivity, for example, which has been an absolute priority, and where we have made real strides um, through and um, since the pandemic. Um, some of the other areas are um, we're working on with partners to really establish how that can be sustainable and how collectively we can make the biggest impact um, in some of those areas where we need to very much work with citizens and communities uh, to be able to tackle issues like access to um, you know, affordable tariffs um, and to um, devices um, and indeed in some instances to skills as well. But Jeff, do you want to say maybe say something about um, what the work that we've done on Connectivity. Uh, uh, maybe just to pick up some of the change the programme's gone through. So the, during the COVID period, the response that we had to digital inclusion was really quite narrow. You know, we effectively give people devices, we give them connections, you know, we issued those, and it was very much led from within the digital directorate, as was then. Um, <laughs> the Auditor General's report identifies the need for the approach to digital inclusion to be considerably more broad-based. It needs to be everybody's business. It needs to be about how we design and deliver services. It needs to be about how we develop a broader skills agenda, not just for the 60,000 people who were given devices. And that's a considerably more complex and involved process than simply you know, issuing, you know, going through a procurement and then issuing devices through voluntary sector organisations. So I think what you've seen during the period since the, um, the COVID pandemic is you know, a, a change in how the project is, the, the programme is put together to begin to address those issues, to think about how we reach out and engage properly with health, how we work with social security, how we work across different sectors as part of the child poverty agenda as well, and, and how we think about how we weave this into not just you know, digital inclusion or digital device um, management into the, the process by which it becomes how we think about public services. So. That, that's, the, that's really the change that we've been going through. And then you see things such as the Digital Inclusion Alliance, the work that's been done by SCVO, the work that's been done by local government, all leaning into that very different sort of agenda, which isn't simply, can we give you a device? Yeah, yeah. And, and so, I th so I think while we accept the generality, we have gone through you know, quite a, a difficult change process as part of that in terms of resetting expectations as to how the programme works and also what that means for our colleagues across government and the public sector. Well, let's, let's not deal with generalities then. Let's deal with some specifics. Paragraph 35, 36 of the report, which uh, I remind you was published just in August of this year, so it's quite a recent report, says at that point, the joint digital strategy lacks a clear plan and accountability and is now to be refreshed amidst difficult public finances. <coughs> the Scottish Government and COSLA joint strategy lacks a delivery plan that sets out the detailed actions that are needed, who is responsible for them, and timescales or monitoring arrangements. How do you respond to that? I think that's the work that Jeff is setting out that is underway. So have you now got detailed actions? Do you, have you designated who is responsible for them? Do you have timescales and monitoring arrangements? So, so the work that we're currently doing with local government colleagues, with colleagues across the um, Scottish Government and the wider public sector, is how we actually refresh the 21 strategy. So the, 19, the, the 2021 strategy set out a, a broad range um, of objectives in respect of digital. Um, you know, I would say you know, my, 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 my reading of it is it, it could have been more um, developed in terms of how who was responsible for different actions. In practical terms, the majority of the actions have fallen to the digital directorate, which doesn't really reflect the complexity of the digital environment. And so the work that we've been doing with um, Minister McKee, 
with colleagues in, in, in COSLA, um, which we'll be discussing in a couple of weeks' time with the, uh, the, the Joint Leadership Board uh, between Mr McKee and Councillor Hagman, focuses on how we can produce more of a, an overarching strategy supported by very clear action plans, including sectoral action plans in areas such as health and education which produce detailed um, commitments in those areas. I mean, so we've been told a few times already this morning in the first 10 minutes that this is complicated, but some of these things are quite simple. I mean, in paragraph 37 of the uh, report that we're discussing, it notes that meetings of key governance groups have been infrequent. What's the explanation for that? So the, um, the, programme, the programme board has um, met... I would say probably three times a year, which is fairly standard for a programme board, um, over, uh, looking over a, a process. It's been supported by um, working groups. It's been supported by action outside the programme board as well. You know, similarly, the um, joint leadership board, which I've referred to, has identified four priorities which it's been working on. Um, you know, as you'll be aware, we've gone through you know, a series of change of ministers, and for that reason, various meetings have been rescheduled. Um, but as I've said, we are meeting again in two weeks' time, and at that meeting we will be considering this report, um, uh, you know, as it's one of the four priorities of the leadership group. The four priorities are common components, digital inclusion, connectivity and skills, and pre predominantly public sector workforce skills. So those areas were, are the ones which have been in focus uh, as being of the highest priority for that group. So can I just clarify then, this report came out in August, uh, tomorrow is November, uh, this group hasn't met to discuss the report uh, that you are giving evidence to us on this morning. It, it, it was planned to... So this report was originally planned to come out during um, July. Um, because of the election it was postponed, yeah. yeah. And, and at that point we did have a meeting in place which would have taken place around, uh, either just ahead or just beyond, but again, because of the election, we lost that meeting. And just with the challenges of scheduling and diaries and things like that, November is the point that we've put the um, meeting in for. OK, right. Um, uh, Mr Walsh, could I perhaps bring you in here and, and ask whether you... Uh, do, I mean, does Co first of all, does COSLA accept the uh, findings and the recommendations of this report? But we do, absolutely, 100%, because digital services is the way to go, digital nation, especially with the other kind of set goals and priorities we have for the citizens of Scotland and the Scottish Government. Thanks. So can I turn then with you to one of the um, uh, particular points that's made uh, in the report? and ask whether you accept this finding. So the uh, Accounts Commission Auditor General report found uh, that the Local Government Digital Office, the delivery body for the Local Government Digital Partnership, does not include tackling digital exclusion as part of its work programme. We do have tackling inclusion in there under the auspice of services design and also capability and capacity building. Um, the challenge has been getting resources in place to actually then support that work due to the small budgets that we actually have as an operating uh, as the digital office. OK, so, sorry, uh, Mr Walter, are you saying that you, you do accept that uh, finding or you don't accept that finding? I, I don't necessarily accept the finding because we do have right. uh, instances of, of doing stuff around about with services, Scottish reports of service design, to look at inclusion in the, the way we actually manage and create services in local government. Um, so I wouldn't accept that to the full extent. OK. Um, and, and staying with you, Mr Wallace, then let's have a look at one of the recommendations. One of the recommendations is that uh, councils should map out local resources and assets across the public, private and third sectors, provide clear routes to digital support and accessible information. I mean, is that a recommendation that COSLA accepts? Is that something which individual local authorities are pursuing? That's something we actually accept and something we've been doing in conjunction with Scottish Government for a while. OK. So if I... Um, uh, go to a local authority in the area that um, I represent, they will be, uh, or already will have done, a mapping of local resources uh, and an overview of the third sector, the public, as well as the private sector. I would, to, I'm sorry, I don't know what area you expect, but I would expect so, yes. But for the 32 local authorities in Scotland, are each of those local authorities carrying out that recommendation? And um, doing that mapping and doing that mapping work. The mapping has started from the back of the back of this report to be accelerated, so I would expect that it has been done by now. Okay, okay. Um, before I bring in the deputy convener, could I go back to you, uh, Leslie Fraser, and ask whether you accept uh, the recommendation that's contained in the in the report, which talks about building into strategies and design for digital that 
all public bodies should carry out equality and human right impact assessments. Do you accept that recommendation? We absolutely accept that um, public bodies should be following the requirements to undertake um, the assessments that uh, they're required to do by, by law. Um, that's that's uh, critically important. And the equalities impact assessments in terms of digital accessibility are um, very significant and important. Um, and I think the, the design standards that Martin was referring to are a really important way in which we can practically underpin that and give uh, colleagues right the way across the public sector uh, guidance about the best way, best way to do that. So have you issued guidance to health boards, uh, Scottish, <laughs> Scottish Enterprise, all those, all those other public bodies that yeah. you've got oversight of? The, um, the design standards are readily available for all of those uh, public bodies to draw from. Yeah. So, so the, the, this, the, the Scottish Service Design Standard um, applies to all um, Scottish Government and public bodies uh, projects that fall within the um, technology assurance framework and it's a requirement that they all comply with that. So effectively it's a mandatory requirement for um, I, I guess all the projects that come before you as part of the report that we issue to you, and, and that's probably, I would say, about 80% of those, of those projects. Um, the NHS has separate arrangements, and um, within those arrangements also makes use of the service design standard. It's also committed to the service design standard. Um, and so on that basis, we would expect them to, to follow it as well. And it, it's quite onerous in terms of the focus on usability, accessibility, equalities, to understand the service from the perspective of the user and the various different types of users. So very much this is built into the process. And, and you know, as we've been developing the next stage of the Connecting Scotland programme, that's been one of the areas that we've been very deliberately looking to lean into, to actually understand that if you're going to offer a service through a digital channel, you need to assure yourselves that the people who you're offering that service to are able to access it through a digital channel. And that doesn't then become effectively a, a digital directorate challenge to solve that problem. If, if it's a you know, digital front door, if it's um, you know, how people learn, in each of those cases it needs to be the public body which is responsible for delivering the service that needs to be taking account of that. But can I just go back um, to the report itself? So the report itself is identifying an insufficiency when it comes to carrying out equality uh, and human rights impact assessments. There should, be, there should be more, it should be systematic. It doesn't appear to be systematic. So I'm asking you whether you're providing any leadership as, as the Scottish Government to public bodies on that, to say not in a kind of general sense, this is something you ought to do, but are you driving that? Are you, may, are you embedding that in, in the digital strategies which have been adopted by public bodies across Scotland? So, so I'm not sure that I agree with that because it, it is quite clear as part of the assurance framework which we apply to the delivery of digital services, this is a requirement and a necessary step to take a, a project through the various gateways that it's required to go through to receive sign-off and, and funding. So I, I don't agree that we don't do that. Um, we don't do that as an external, explicit, separate process, but we, because we build it into the service development and the design phase of a, of, of a service. Sorry, but can I, again, just, this will be my final question. Are you saying, if we were to FOI public bodies in Scotland, or write to them as the Public Audit Committee of the Scottish Parliament, and ask them to send us their equality and human rights impact assessment regarding their digital strategies, or their, the, the rollout of digitalisation in areas of public service delivery, they would be able to send us those back or not. So, so I, I would expect that what they would send you back would be the equalities impact assessments that they've done in respect of the service, because it, alongside uh, not just the digital component of a service, because alongside digital channels, we do make it a requirement that people are also able to access services in, in a non-digital way should they choose to do so. And so I think you have to look at the totality of the service, not one component of a service, to understand the degree to which it meets equalities requirements. So that's what my expectation would be, is what you would see, and that's the requirement that we certainly operate under. That if we're offering something through a digital channel, it also has to be available through a non-digital channel. And that means our EQIA has to address the totality of the service, not just a component of a service. OK, well, other members of the committee want to come in, so I'm going to bring in Graham Simpson uh, for one quick question before yeah. I turn to the deputy convener. It, it, it's just to clear up some confusion for me. Um, Les, Leslie Fraser 
you said right at the start in response to the convener that you accepted all the recommendations in the report, but Mr Huggins said there'd be no meeting to discuss it. So what were you basing your... Well, that's what he said. Um, so mm. what were you basing... Have, has there been a meeting to discuss it or not? So, well, so just, just to be clear, we've been meeting fairly regularly. We've also met with the team who were producing the report. We've been acting on the information that we were aware was going to come as part of the report across the summer. We haven't had a meeting of the joint ministerial and consular group since the publication of the report, and that will take place. But we've been meeting fairly actively in respect of this report. So has the report been discussed? If so, by who? The, the report's been discussed by, by senior officials. Um, it's been um, briefed and, and, and set out for ministers, and they uh, understand the contents of the report. You know, it, it, we had been planning and, and preparing for a publication in July, and you know, we were ready for a publication in July, having considered also what our response to it would have been at that stage. So it's not that we've been waiting for today to consider what we think of the report. We've been pretty busy. But who, who is, and I just want to get to the nub of this, who is it that has met to decide that you agree the recommendations in the report? So we've disc we've just you know, on behalf of Scottish ministers, you know, we have met with ministers and discussed the report with ministers, and you know, we've um, the, yeah. And there's a further discussion about you know, next steps and actions that will come out of the joint board in two weeks' time. You know, it'll effectively set the agenda for the next six months for the joint work between COSLA and the Scottish government. But you know, on the basis of our acceptance of the report. OK, I'm going to bring in the Deputy Convener, Jamie. Thank, thank you, Convener. Good morning to our guests. Um, I have to say, I, I find this report rather depressing in its content. Um, it is undoubtedly critical of the progress or lack thereof of addressing digital exclusion. And, and I say I'm depressed because when I joined this Parliament eight years ago, my very first portfolio, if you like, was... Uh, appointed on me as the Shadow Digital Minister, which I found quite amusing because I wasn't a digital minister to shadow. So I don't know if my former leader was just keeping me busy and out of trouble, but the point is, at that point, I felt that there should be a digital minister. Government should have someone dedicated to tackling uh, digital exclusion, <laughs> connectivity, and also enhancing the skills of the general populace. Uh, so we're somewhat eight years on now, and the content of this report, I don't think, reflect sufficient progress, notwithstanding some of the issues that we've gone through during the COVID period. Can I turn your attention to paragraph 42? Uh, and so these, you know, that, that's perhaps a subjective view from an individual member of this parliament, but the Auditor General is clear himself when he says it is unclear whether digital exclusion remains a priority for government. I'm paraphrasing, particularly in the absence of a clear strategy and supporting activity. The Scottish Government has not yet set out any revised ambitions for tackling digital exclusion. It's there in black and white. That was just a few months ago. Was he right or wrong? Shall I pick that up first? Yeah. Or, well, um, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, as, the, as the report identifies, and you know, it helpfully sets out the different components of digital exclusion, you know, it identifies the connectivity agenda you know, under which we have very clear... Um, minis you know, you know, Scottish Government-wide commitments in terms of access to both, both broadband and 4G. So in that area, we have very clear commitments. Um, beyond that, we then have the expectations in terms of design and delivery of public services and digital channels. And you know, I would agree that at this stage, you know, we don't have commitments in that area equivalent to maybe other jurisdictions such as Singapore or you know, the very, very most leading countries in the world. But you know, we, are, we are heading in that direction. In, in terms of digital skills, you know, we can also track and you know, are aware that the general digital literacy in the population is you know, at or above what it is for the rest of the UK. So if we're thinking of the, you know, and I think this is the only way in which we can approach this agenda, is not seeing a single thing called digital inclusion but actually understanding the component elements and ensuring that we're actually addressing all of those component elements. And as I, as I said to the convener earlier, you know, this is how the challenge of moving from a simply giving devices to people program to actually addressing both the, you know, the causes and the interactions that are actually in place there. 
makes it significantly more challenging. So we do have very tangible commitments in place in respect of aspects of the agenda, but not all, all aspects, as you say. But isn't that, isn't that deflective of the problem itself? Is I, I do see some, some good work taking place. You talk about some of the technical connectivity that's going on. And these are long-term projects. I mean, I remember talking about the R100 project nearly a decade ago, uh, yet that work is, is yet to be completed. Um, but much of that, uh, the, the heavy lifting of that has been done by the private sector, and indeed much of the investment has been done by the private sector. So there's limited uh, intervention from government on that res in that respect. Well, £600 million is quite a major investment. Well, over 10 years, I mean. £600 million over seven years um, since 2017. Um, 56, sorry, 55 4GI masts, um, 16 undersea cables. You know, significant rollout. You know, at a point where 99% um, of all households have got 4G um, in the household available. 95% um, of all ha properties have got a super fast broadband connection, and 73% have got a gigabyte broadband connection. You know, because under um, R100, we decided to invest in um, gigabyte at the outset. We didn't. We haven't waited to the, the later programs that have come across come along since. From the UK government, um, so we have made major changes, and £600 million pounds <laughs> within our budgets is not a small amount of money. Mm. So, why, why does one in ten households still have no access to the internet in Scotland? It, it's not, sorry, 95% um, of all households have got direct access through superfast broadband, and 99% have got access through 4G, can have access to 4G. So, for those houses that don't have availability of connectivity through the um, broadband um, or the, you know, we also have the availability of vouchers and you know, we've been exploring things such as low earth orbit satellites and things like that as well yeah. so so we you know, we will achieve our targets here we're also working very strongly with the uk government as well on the rollout of the uk wide gigabit project and you know, you'll have seen that we issued the tenders yeah. for the first lots of that earlier in the year mm -hmm. in the south of scotland um, and we've got the further lots coming later in the year so this is a, a major success story of you know, significant infrastructure investment, which has had to go through quite a lot of challenges. You know, you'll recall two to three years ago, we were faced with both significant cost inflation in terms of materials. We had you know, workforce challenges. And, and we've you know, aggressively managed these contracts to ensure that this is delivered for the people of Scotland. Yeah, I, I mean, there may be some disparity in the figures. I'm just quoting from the Audit General's report itself, uh, which... Uh, is quoting direct Scottish Government figures. The Scottish Household Survey, the last published December 23, appreciate there's probably another one coming out soon. Yeah. So that number of 91% may have gone up, and hopefully it has. Um, but notwithstanding <laughs> that, I mean, ha having, having technical access is not the same as having the knowledge to use what you're able to access. Uh, and it remains a fact that 15% of our population still lack basic foundation digital skills. So relative to many people that can access high-speed internet, to those who have the skills to is, is disproportionate. Can I ask uh, how, what work you're doing to benchmark that in terms of either other parts of the UK or indeed perhaps the OECD region of which we're a part of? Yeah, so, so the 15% the, the 15, um, 15 figure that's referred to there comes out of a UK-wide survey, which identified that Scotland was sitting at around 85%, you know, predominantly those people who aren't, um, you know, who don't have the necessary skills do tend to be older people and, you know, also in particular the more disadvantaged. And I, I guess that's where we see projects such as the digital lifelines work that the you know, health, health, health colleagues have taken forward as being you know, very pertinent in terms of that. You know, reaching reaching those spaces, the, the figure for the rest of the UK is 84 percent. So you know, it's, this is a, a common problem that all modern nations are going through, which is to um, upskill the population. You know, with that, you know, as I've said, you know, predominantly the group who are have fewer or less skills um, uh, do tend to be the older population. And you know, there's a question as to whether this is a problem that over time will you know, in continue to diminish. Mm -hmm. Um, at the uh, exhibit two of the report that we're discussing today um, talks about digital exclusion and people's human rights. Um, in fact, the, the overall report took a human rights-based approach, um, and uh, Audit Scotland made that very clear uh, very early on in the report. And I think that's a, a good angle to take. People's human rights uh, are important, but there are very num there are a number of very specific human rights which this report identifies that could be affected by a lack of access to digital services. And they include the rights to receive and impart information, 
protection from discrimination, the right to access <coughs> education and social security, for example, and so on. Um, can I ask what analysis has been undertaken at the moment as to the potential risk of uh, the Scottish Government breaching human rights with respect to digital exclusion? Uh, or perhaps are there any live cases in the system that would reflect such breaches? Um, I'm, I'm going to, I'll bring Ailey in a second to talk about the um, minimum digital living standard, which very much is, is, is in this space. Um, I, I'm not aware of any live cases within the system. Okay. Um, generally, I would understand that human rights relate to the access and availability of services. Um, and within that, um, digital is generally a channel by which you access those services. And it, it goes back to the, you know, the, the, the comments I made earlier that the requirement that we believe sits on us is to provide both digital and non-digital channels. And so we would consider the application of rights you know, within that generality, not as a right to a service through a particular challenge, channel. You know, so, so that's probably how we'd understand that. But if I can bring Ilya in to talk about the work that we're doing with the University of Liverpool and others and learning from the, the Welsh Government in this area. Thank you. So the minimum digital living standard is a fairly new concept. It was developed by the universities of Liverpool and Loughborough. And the actual standard itself that's available at the moment, which is a UK level standard, relates to households with children, which is particularly pertinent when we consider our child poverty family groups. We considered what the Welsh Government were doing in this space. They had done additional research to understand where there was any particular Welsh aspects that the minimum digital living standard could then address. And we determined that actually that would be a really interesting and important exercise to take account of in terms of a Scottish context, mostly because it would actually underpin some of the um, considerations that we're already aware in terms of particularly rural and remote access. The minimum digital living standard is in four sections. It covers connectivity, devices, skills and cyber. It looks at connectivity not only in terms of the download speed, but also the availability. And it looks at it not necessarily from a social tariff point of view, but it's very clear that if you are a household with a couple of children, you are going to need X number of gigabytes compared to others and a fast speed because you're going to have more streaming requirements. So it really gets into the nitty gritty of example and connectivity of what people might need. And that then is replicated across the four areas of the standard. The reason why this is important for us is because if we have one in a Scottish context, we can align it with the Scottish service design principles that have already been discussed this morning, so it can be built into those, but also allows us as government, but also our local authority colleagues, to use that as a baseline to help with the data that they may have on their populations to understand where their population is and then be able to target help appropriately. I'm glad you raised education. Uh, the Scottish Government famously made a commitment to uh, distribute free digital devices to school children, particularly laptops, tablets, etc. Can you advise if that was successful and 100% delivered? Well, a number of devices were indeed provided, I think, um, um, around 70,000 from memory. Um, so that uh, was really important again at that period when COVID um, was such a feature of our, of our lives, uh, critically important that young people could get access to online education uh, there. So I think that that was, um, you know, an enormous collective effort and was successful at the time. 70,000. <clears> Just to put that into context, what, what's that proportionally to the, to the amount that, that could or should have been distributed? In, in itself, it sounds a lot, but it could mean nothing if it's... So, so, so I think in terms of the, um, education devices, and you know, Mar Martin may want to come in on, on this as well, um, a, a number of councils have taken, had taken the approach and have distributed devices pretty much universally across their area. Um, other councils have taken different approaches to how they take forward learning. Um, there had been a previous commitment by Scottish Government to invest directly in those councils that hadn't done so, um, but... In the context of different, the challenging funding uh, situation, um, that 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 you know that you know that didn't go forward. Um, what we are currently doing is we're working with education colleagues in respect of uh, potential investment of um, ten million pounds for for the 25-26 year, which is what the cabinet secretary for education has announced, to to um, on the basis of a targeted scheme to identify where that could be best be used. But again, we'll need to uh, take that forward with colleagues in COSLA under the Verity House Agreement, because, again, it reaches into that space, which is you know, 
a, a local government responsibility. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, but I mean, that sort of demonstrates my point. If, if, if you're going to tackle the digital exclusion and improve access and, and make a commitment to distribute devices, which is a key component, um, and then fail to do so, does that not, is that not the reason perhaps why reports like this are so critical of progress? Perhaps that's a, to Ms Fraser as, as you're in charge of this. I think the um, it was as uh, Jeff has been saying, you know, it was critically important that we got devices to people at that point during COVID. But actually, the the issues of um, digital exclusion, I think the report sets out really well. You know, that it is multifaceted, and that is the approach that we are now taking with our partners um, in order to be able to to tackle this in a sustainable uh, way that that tackles the issue. Um, you know, for the for the future. Um, the, the devices issue alone is one component of that, but it's not, uh, it can't really be seen in isolation. <coughs> Excuse me. The, the Scottish Government was, was keen to ensure that the uh, rights of children were incorporated and enshrined in, in law in Scotland. Um, do you believe at the moment that any of the uh, articles of the UNCRC are currently being breached as a result of digital exclusion? I could, for example, will point you towards Articles 13, 17 and 26, which are very specifically related to access to information, access to social security and so on. Mm -hmm. And in accordance with Article 45, which uh, ensures that governments must consult with UNICEF on their um, uh, policies with regards to the rights of children, um, can I ask if that piece of consultation has, worked, has taken place or indeed if the Scottish Government has worked with UNICEF on its roll out of tackling digital exclusion insofar as regards to children? The, um, as uh, Jeff has said, the important uh, aspect here is that you can access the service <coughs> through a channel that works for you. Now, that might be a digital route or it might be uh, through face-to-face uh, -face services or through other routes. And the, um, the design standards, which are based on a and equalities and, and uh, rights-based approach um, ensure that those different channels are available. And I think that's the, the, the critically important um, area. I'm not f um, aware of whether um, work has been uh, undertaken in that specific area. No, but the, um, the Scottish Government contributes to the UK-wide. Um, I, I, I don't think it's annual. I think it's, it might be biannual report on the um, <coughs> Convention on the Rights of the Child. And again, as part of that, we're required to assure ourselves that we are you know, meeting the obligations that sit at Scottish Government level in respect of that. I, I do think, it, though, it comes back to this discussion about whether there is a right to a particular ch channel of access or whether the right is the generality, you know, it's the right to the service. And I, I guess in, you know, in considering um, e Exhibit 2, you know, the example of you know, non-access to a service which is offered there is, uh, is access to universal credit, which is a UK Government benefit, it's not a Scottish Government benefit. You know, Social Security Scotland has done extensive work to ensure that people who don't have digital access are able to fully engage with and access benefits within Scotland. Um, so I, I, I think this is, you know, this, this, the, 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 the challenge here is that you know, some countries across the world, um, and again, you know, we've, we're doing quite a lot of work with colleagues at the moment from Denmark, they, they've made it pretty close to mandatory that you access services through a, a digital channel. And that brings with it additional um, obligations and responsibilities. And it's, it's in the context of you know, where they are on their digital journey, which makes it possible for them to, 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 to do that. You know, where we are in Scotland is that we continue to you know, um, work on the basis that the individual has a degree of choice. And, and also you know, services you know, continue as they continue to develop will continue to be multi-channel, you know, whether mm -hmm. it's through telephone or appointment or in person or through digital channels. And I, I think that's where the, you know, the particular human rights aspect of this becomes significant, is that it applies at the level of access to service, not at the access to channel. Um, others will, will ask questions about access to more local services, particularly through local authorities, um, uh, and perhaps some of the difficulties that, that they face. But, I mean, and you talk about Denmark, talk about Singapore, talk about other, other countries. I mean, at no point is, is anyone just maybe a little bit embarrassed by the lack of progress in Scotland? Do you not feel as a nation we should be leading the way, not chasing? So the, there's a, um, a, an annual survey of digital progress across um, 
um, advanced nations and the UK, of which Scotland is part, generally comes within the top 10 of that. So we, you know, we are not a poorly performing nation in respect of digital services. We are a good, well performing. We are not at the top of the league. You know, that's clear. Um, but we are making good progress. And you know, again, we'll be very happy to talk to the committee at, at a future date about you know, our progress on digital services more generally. So. I'll maybe come back and later. Can, uh, um, can I just come back to something you said earlier on, uh, Mr Huggins, which is that so you said it was a major success story, but you also then said uh, on the subject of digital exclusion, inferring, I think, that um, uh, it's an ageing population that is digitally excluded, that over time this will uh, diminish, as though you think that people are going to die off and the problem will go away. I mean, that's not what this report says, is it? It says that age is a factor, of course it is, and everybody understands that. But in the introduction to the report, it says, digital exclusion is strongly associated with poverty and people with certain protected characteristics. So, I mean, maybe I can ask the Director General, what is the Scottish Government's position? Is it that... Uh, you think the problem is going to diminish over time because older people are going to die? Or is it that you see there's a real and present issue here because, uh, because of people's uh, impoverishment and because of the protected characteristics that, that that's going to continue to be there and is continue to be a challenge and is something the government needs to accept some leadership over? Yeah. That is the basis on which the 2021 digital strategy was developed that uh, this, this digital exclusion is a complex set of issues. Absolutely, that there's a factor of poverty and inequality. It's also a factor of geographic access, um, as we've been discussing. It's a factor of, of skills. It's a factor of well-designed public services. So these are issues that we absolutely take seriously. Um, that's why the thrust of this report is, is very welcome and it aligns absolutely with the work that we are taking forward with our partners uh, to address that on a multifaceted um, um, approach, as, as Jeff has been saying. And poverty and inequality, as, as Jeff acknowledged, is a, is a critical component of that and it's why we very much align the work that we are taking forward with, for example, the broader work of tackling poverty um, in government and uh, child poverty um, particularly. So, yeah, we see this as a multifaceted uh, set of issues where we need to take action across these um, set of areas. OK, thank you. I'm going to now bring in Colin Beatty to put some questions to you. Colin. Thank you. Um, Pre-COVID, I had a meeting with uh, Ofcom, and they very helpfully produced some statistics uh, in my constituency, and the Midlothian part of my constituency was quite a shocker because at that time 34% of the population, adult population, had uh, no access to a smartphone or to internet. Now, I'm sure COVID drove huge changes in that, and I've not seen an up-to-date figure, but nevertheless, even if that figure is down by two-thirds, it's still you know, it's just a notional figure, but even if it's down by as much as that, it's still quite significant. There is, I think, an assumption that you're digitally excluded due to age or infirmity or whatever. And, you know, from my point of view, I want to hit back on that one. But uh, I think that what I'm trying to get to is to what extent do we have an analysis of the different uh, sectors, categories, however you want to put it, of people who are digitally excluded at this time. I personally have met a surprising number of people who don't want a smartphone, don't want the internet or, or, or any of the, the social media contacts, it means they're almost off-grid. <laughs> and their ability to access services is fairly limited. You could say by choice in their cases, but <coughs> as you know, there's many other categories that it's not choice. So how do you analyse this? How do you get the breakdown of who is it that is not able to access digital services? Yeah, no, really important. And the work that Ailey was referring to earlier on minimum uh, digital living standards and how that you know, looks across Scotland, I think is going to be really important in building our knowledge here. 
Um, obviously, um, you know, social tariffs and, and the regulation of tariffs is with Ofcom and regulated at the, at the UK um, level, but we do work uh, closely uh, with colleagues at, at UK level. Um, I'll maybe bring in um, Ailey to, to talk a bit more about the work that we've been doing there and uh, how we're um, just addressing that set of issues um, that Mr Beattie... Uh, Thanks, Leslie. So the work that's out at the moment, the surveys that we're at the moment, as Jeff's already mentioned, are actually, um, a lot of them are UK level. And when you drill down, for example, onto the Lloyds Banking Survey, which they do every year on this area, the, the population that they um, survey in Scotland is relatively small, so we're extrapolating out from quite a small survey pitch out to larger numbers. It's quite complex to get a handle on the exact data of who and who's not excluded, and there's many reasons for that. So, for example, as you mentioned, that some people choose not to, but then you're not going to necessarily understand that reasoning, that motivation, by simply asking, are you online? You'll get a black and white answer of yes or no, I, I am online. We've also had a lot of changing circumstances over the past couple of years with the cost of living crisis, and that has driven um, different behaviours in different people where they've got to make choices on where they spend their money. So because of that, you have all, all the time an, an, a, a flux in terms of population of people who are online or not, or who choose to be or not, depending on, for example, their financial circumstances. Part of the work that we're currently doing as Connecting Scotland team um, as well as taking forward the minimum digital living standard, is that we are looking at commissioning um, a data piece in Scotland to really understand the available data sets we've got. So, for example, how the Scot Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation compared to <coughs> R100 data, compared to uptake of connectivity, and what picture that can paint of us, because that then allows us to understand which populations are more in need of support and help, and target that using things like the minimum digital living standard to support. But it, coming back again to those that choose not to adopt these services, how do you support them? As or do they have no freedom of choice at all and must simply comply, which is what some of the council services, for example, and some of the government services now, uh, now offer? I will pass to Mr Wallace about council services in a moment. As Jeff has already mentioned, there is a requirement that we still give access to services through other means other than digital. And whether these are publicised and people know about them is a different question, not one that we're particularly potentially here to answer. But there are other routes to services that re people require. Um, I'll pass to Mr Wallace to talk about local authority position. So from a local government position, we've also got a case for everybody, every single citizen in Scotland. So there is means to get access to services if it's online too, through contact centres or through help desks within the offices. Challenges are obviously keeping lights on, facilities, etc., with limited budgets is a challenge. So there is analysis being done in some areas to look at where's the best place to actually pitch up to do these kind of help centres to help the people that do need these access who don't have digital access to get access to services to, still at the moment in time. But coming back to what you were talking about. You're, you're talking about possibly having a consult, consultation which would drive more detail in terms of the different uh, categories of people that do not have uh, access to digital. At least that's, that's how I interpreted what you said. Not necessarily consultation because sometimes getting responses from people who are you know, at most need can be quite difficult. What we do is we work with third sector partners, we work with local authorities, we've been working with the improvement service to really understand what the landscape is out there and who's being helped and, and why. Um, I just wanted to address one of the points you made about choice. One of the, the issues that we have as a digital society is that um, driving towards the issue of um, provision of services digitally is not solely a government issue. The private sector have a role to play here too, and that's one of the reasons why the Digital Inclusion Alliance is pulling together third public and private sector in this space, because there's a recognition that all have a part to play in making sure that access to services <coughs> is appropriate. Well, you talk about the private sector, and what immediately comes to mind, of course, are utility companies and so on, who are almost impenetrable as far as their uh, digital services are concerned. Uh, I can understand why people throw their hands up and uh, decide to go off grid, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, you've still got this issue. We don't know who the different people are, broadly, that uh, are not accessing digital services. We assume there's older people. We assume that there's people doing it through choice. 
We assume there's people doing it due to poverty, lack of means, and there could be other categories due to disabilities and all sorts of things. But we don't actually know, even as an estimate, as to how big these populations are, and there doesn't seem to be a plan as to how to reach them. So, so I think there's a couple of things on that. So we do know, um, we, we, you know, we we do know ex exactly how many which properties in Scotland have got a good broadband connection. So you've got all the statistics. So we we've we've got that data, and you know we've got a there's a lookup thing you can look up and you know, put your address but in. Broadband's only part of it. Yeah, but at the same time, so the the availability of that surface is the first stage. <laughs> We then have the question as to whether somebody actually takes up a contract with one of the providers. And when we when we were doing the R100 contracts, there's a presumption that um, if there was a particular area that maybe 80% um, of the people or 70% of the people would actually take up um, a contract having been given access through the connection. What we've actually found is that those numbers have been significantly exceeded and more people have actually taken up a connection that was anticipated as part of the contract. And, th and that's quite good because that means we get money back and that, you know, it, it, it effectively gives us back um, resource which we, which we can reuse for, for other purposes. B beyond that, you know, we, we then have the, you know, the better and improving information that we have around skills. But, but one of the big drivers here is going to be the quality of public and private sector services in that the reason why people adopt a technology is because it helps them do something that they want to do in a way that works for them. And I think that's why a lot of the focus that we have at the moment is on the quality and the ease of use, and that takes us into things such as how people are able to sort of you know, use their identity online, how they're able to do things like store their credentials so they have to, don't have to refill in forms and things like that. You know, this is the, the, the big agenda here is to make the, the prize that people have such that they want to, to gain the skills and they want to have the connection and they want to, to use the service. Um, because I think that's one of the areas which I think has been underplayed historically in this agenda, in that a, a lot of people don't engage digitally because it's really hard work. <laughs> and you know, our job is to make it not hard work, it's to make it easier than to doing it any other way so that they, 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 they use it on that basis. So uh, we're, again, you know, we're able to sort of carve up aspects of this you know, as, as you say, we don't have the complete story of exactly who doesn't have access and for what reason, you know, because there will be different reasons for different people within that. But we're getting closer to that every year. And, and it's not just about older people, it's also about connectivity and it's about skills. Each of the different agendas that we're running here is eating away at that number of digitally excluded people. You know, it's, it, it's a complex story, as we've, as we've agreed. You know, I, I think, you know, we... we um, you know, the experience that we're seeing across the islands in terms of connectivity has just been transformational over the last three or four years. You know, ministers come back from summer tours and they tell me that the 4G connection was better on Stornoway than it is in the centre of Edinburgh and that you know, they're they more able to do their work easily you know, in some areas than they would ever have thought would be, would be the case. So you know, the, the, the agenda here is very much to play all of these games to get to the point at which you know, we achieve the objective, which is you know, a fully included... Um, population. You did touch on one interesting point, which is that, uh, of course, digital can be complicated. And uh, you know, the number of apps I've got on my phone, because everybody insists that you download an app before you can do anything. It's a major task in, at the beginning just to find the app that you need to be able to, to get into, the, into whatever system you're trying to access. So I can understand why a lot of people choose not to participate. Yeah, you know, ease, ease, of, ease of use is a, is a key thing here. And, and, and I guess, you know, we've all had experience of why we've downloaded something, you know, whether it's because we want to park the car um, or, you know, we want to get access to a particular venue or we want to, you know, do a range, buy something online. And at, at that point, you know, the, you know, it does then become a question of, you know, the degree, you know, ease of use and channel. And, and government services need to be in that space as well. They need to be the thing that you want to have <coughs> Because it will make your life, it'll make your life easier. Just coming back to the wider issue of lack of progress in tackling digital exclusion. What's the impact being you know, of the joint national strategy, a uh, changing nation, uh, and how Scotland will thrive in a digital world? We aim to ensure that nobody was left behind, and the digital participation charter has been measured. How is, it be, how is it being used to inform 
this refresh strategy that you're talking about? The, um, we, we published a report on the 21 strategy in May of this year, which set out the, the main areas in which we had made progress. And a, a good deal of that is what we've already covered in being in the connectivity agenda, where you know, over the last six, seven years, we've moved from about 73% to 95%, um, 99% for, 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 for 4G at the household level. So a good set of improvement there. Similarly, the agenda in respect of the digital academy and skills, which is predominantly around the public sector workforce and understanding the need to do there. Again, significant work forward, both within central and local government and across public bodies. So a lot of, a lot of progress. We also then have the, you know, the various particular programmes around identity, payments, adoption of cloud, uh, again, which we've spoken to the committee about before, and you know, all of those are now delivered and running as live services. You know, three years ago, none of those were live services. So there, you know, there's been significant change there. So there's, there's elements of this in respect of the inclusion agenda, but it probably addresses some aspects of digital inclusion. And over the next period of time, and you know, as, as we're, alongside the, this report, which we're looking at, in a couple of weeks' time, we're setting up the arrangements for how we take forward <coughs> publication of a strategy and um, an update to the strategy in 25, but doing so in, in a way which is maybe more encompassing across government. So the, one of the criticisms you know, that you might make of the 21 strategy is it's a government strategy, but it seems to be largely about what the digital directorate does. And the 25 strategy, when it comes out, will be overarching to cover all of government and, and local government but on the expect expectation that we then see um, documents below that which cover particular topic areas like um, health and care or education um, or, or enterprise. And as part of that, I'd expect there to be a topic specific action plan that sits underneath that in respect of digital inclusion. And that allows us both to, to knit together across government. Minister McKee has written to the, you know, to the cabinet and his ministerial colleagues basically setting out this has been the proposal. Um, and um, to, to become a lot more tangible, because you know, I, I would agree with the committee that next time round this needs to be better supported by clear action plans and time deliverables. You know, that's my objective. It, it, it makes it easy for me to understand what I need to do and what other people need to do. There seems to be a lot of strategies. Um, maybe ask you another aspect to this, which is the progress in delivering the ambitions of the, uh, the joint national strategy since initial Connecting Scotland programme was delivered, and in particular the role of the Digital Citizen Unit uh, and delivery of the new Connecting Scotland programme, the Digital Inclusion Alliance and the collaborative work between government and other sectors. I'll, I'll, I'll pass that to, to Ailey. Just, just on strategy, though, that was one of the very explicit recommendations that Audit Scotland has have made to us, that there is a need to refresh it. Um, I, you know, I think there was a question for us as to whether we needed to focus more on an action plan, but we've been happy to accept that recommendation and prepare a new strategy document, but that's a clear recommendation in this report. But, Ailey, do you want to say a bit more about Digital Citizen and, and what it does more generally as well? Of course. So the Digital Citizen Division is actually, as you would expect, much wider than just connecting Scotland programmes. We also cover digital ethics, data ethics, unlocking the value of data, and also the records management, data protection and library services of the Scottish Government, so quite wide-ranging. The fundamental piece that joins all those areas together is that it's all about trust, and it's about trust in terms of the information and what we do with it, and making sure that people can have access to that information. The part of the Digital Citizen uh, Division that we're obviously interested in today is Connecting Scotland, and I did want to address, I'm glad the questions come up about programmes. <coughs> I joined the programme in April 22, and at that point the programme was changing from a pandemic programme, and it was a pandemic programme, to what we now see today. It took time, it always takes time, as Jeff has mentioned, to come into the area to understand what's happening and to build the trust with the partners that we had to make sure that they were coming on the journey with us. We have done actually a lot of work in the intervening two and a little bit years that I've been in place. We have not only covered um, a full business case for the direction of Connecting Scotland, we have already um, supported people in off-boarding from the original Connecting Scotland programme, giving them continued um, connectivity to make sure that there was no project. <coughs> that took quite a lot of design. We wanted to make sure that was user-led and adhered to the principles that we've talked about this morning about um, a, a really positive service design experience for those people who'd already benefited from Connecting Scotland. 
We've, in the intervening time, um, run a British and Irish Council event, which um, crossed all uh, administrations and nations of the UK. That was last April, where we had an exceptionally successful event with 150 delegates of, from, from all corners who came to Edinburgh to discuss this very issue. We have um, brought into play the Digital Inclusion Alliance. We've been working with the Short Life Working Group on that, as well as doing the Minimum Digital Living Standard. And on top of that, we have still been grant funding on a one-to-many basis, programmes which are beginning to show evidence of a real impact to the users. So we haven't been standing still by any means of imagination. I accept that it doesn't look as fast-paced as during a pandemic, but I would remind the committee that the pandemic was a particular time it was a pace, time when we were all working at fast pace and for very particular reasons. And that could not be sustained, either in terms of financial sustainability or indeed the welfare of the people involved in delivering that programme. Thank you, Mira. Okay, I'm going to hand straight over to Graeme Simpson uh, for a series of questions. Graeme. Thanks, uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, we're talking about uh, digital exclusion here. I have to say that Mr Beatty sounds... Uh, digitally frustrated um, and who can blame him um, I, I, I was thinking um, just ahead of this session um, what interaction that I as a citizen have with government <clears throat> and I can think of things that where I'd use the UK government um, website uh, for example car, car tax I can check my MOT um, I can get a new passport. Um, we did that recently. My wife got a new passport. That was very, very, very efficient. Um, uh, you can do your tax return on online. Things like that. And then I'm thinking, well, what about the Scottish government? Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. And I'm, to be honest, I'm struggling to think of things that I, as a citizen, would interact with the Scottish government online with. So I really want some help here. Perhaps you could give, give me some examples of where members of the public would use the Scottish Government yeah. website. I'll maybe start with Social Security Scotland yeah. because that's one of the biggest new public services in the country and um, <coughs> providing uh, benefits to around a quarter of the, of the population. And um, yeah, the, the choice there um, of different channels, I think, speaks exactly to the approach that we've been, that we've been setting out. Um, and um, there we're seeing large numbers of people choosing to um, you know, take benefits um, online. Um, so I think um, you know, for Young Carers Grant, for, ex for example, it's, it's well in excess of 95% of, of those would, would choose to go online. And we're seeing very positive feedback as well, people saying that they have a, a good or a very good experience. Um, so hopefully, you know, it, it's been well designed, it's been thought through from the perspective of the, of the citizen. And, um, and that drives then both people to use a, a well designed service, but also then to, to not experience that, that frustration that, that Mr Beattie um, set out. So um, we're, we're certainly seeing that in um, Social Security uh, Scotland. Now, if you choose not to, then there is a wide range of routes in, in conjunction with local government and the third sector um, and with local advisors who can help people in other ways um, to uh, you know, get access to that entitlement um, to which, they're, um, you know, which they have. Um, we, we also are seeing that, uh, some examples, I think, in, um, in health as well, so um, supporting um, 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 people who need access to, to mental health uh, support, um, you know, so uh, that's, uh, that's been a, a really, um, you know, interesting and important area. And um, the Digital Lifelines project there um, in health as well is uh, giving people, um, you know, access to um, advice and support um, that's helping to, to tackle um, drugs issues and, and drugs deaths. So we're seeing, you know, real innovation, I think, in a number of public services using our design standards and really putting the citizen at the heart, um, but clearly wrapping around, you know, digital as one channel supported by other channels. 
craft. Yeah. Maybe a few other examples of things where you might come across a digital channel. So um, if you've got a disclosure certificate, you know, that'll have been done by Disclosure Scotland. And if you do it now, you'll get it issued um, electronically rather than as a piece of paper that comes in the post. Um, and that's using the um, Scott account work that we've done with them. Um, sim similarly, you know, there'll be a number of services that you interact with, which are both in the public and private sector, who you might go not go through the digital channel, but they'll be going through the digital channel. So if you're buying or selling a house, you know, the work that's done with registers will sit there. Similarly, you know, if you've got a septic um, tank in your back garden or something like that, you'll be engaged with SEPA. And you know, we're also doing work with Food Standards Scotland around the, uh, the you know, the, the the licensing and regulatory regime in respect of both um, you know commercial and um, industrial premises to do with food and uh, environmental health. Um, you know, we're also you know, at the moment doing work with student awards, you know, which again may not directly affect you, but you know, may affect people that you know, um, and um, burials and cremations, you know, in terms of the government's legislation in, in that sort of space. So there's a number of areas. So the, you know, the agenda at this stage is really quite broad. One, one which I think you probably will see over the next three or four years is the work that we're currently doing with the NHS Lanarkshire around medical appointment letters. You know, to create a better, um, a, a, a better, a, a new digital channel there as part of the first work that they're doing around digital front door, and looking that to be beyond simply the letter, but what other information that you might wrap around that to make an appointment more likely to be su successful first time, in terms of the activity. So, and, and this is you know this is coming out of the work that we've been doing on cloud and payments and identity over the last three or four years, and these are general infrastructure which you begin to use across a range of services. <coughs> So, so you might not see it directly yourself, but you're almost certainly during today going to be talking to somebody who's using one of our digital channels or shopping in a building where you know, where it's directly connected. Okay, I, th I think that's that, that's very useful. Uh, it, it sets out where uh, members of the public can interact uh, digitally. Um, but you mentioned uh, the, the health service. I'm glad you mentioned that because um, I, you know I think the the health service uh, and generally. Um, I, I wish there was some digital inclusion. Um, I think that generally we're a bit behind the curve in Scotland. Uh, in well, hang on, I haven't finished. Sorry, okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, because you, you 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 mentioned work uh, with NHS Lanarkshire. I think one of the frustrations, certainly for me, is the inability to book a GP appointment or interact with a GP online. Um, there are many, many GPs that just don't offer that service. So I'm interested in what you have to say about NHS Lanarkshire. Can you provide more details on that? So, 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 so a, couple, a couple of things here. So the work that the NHS is doing, and Leslie Fraser has, has already given the example of both the Lifeline's work and the mental health work. So, so where, the, where they have decided to use a digital channel, they have a really strong focus on inclusion and ensuring that, that people are able to up, take up that. I think what you're saying, is, you're saying is generally there's not a digital channel to engage with the NHS, and I think that's not an inclusion issue. That's a general ser ser service issue. The work that we're doing with NHS Lanarkshire and any work that we're doing with colleagues in health is intended to be done in such a way that it's replicable across other health boards. You know, in the, there's no value for us doing a bit of work in NHS Lanarkshire. It needs to offer them a solution which can then be taken up by other health boards and for other aspects of service. Is the, is the first piece of work that we're doing in respect of how um, we can affect it. it, it it's, it's through a project effectively called Digital Mail that we're doing with um, a, D a Danish company who have deployed similar work in, in Denmark. So we're, we're learning and building on experience elsewhere. And, and that will give us both the, some of the infrastructure that we need more generally, but also the learning in terms of how people, because part of the process of developing and delivering a new service like this is getting the feedback, understanding how people experience it, and being able to work through the, the, the problems, including issues to do with accessibility and usability, but also inclusion. So what, is that, you know, what, what does that actually give us in terms of additional information? So as we roll out and take the programme further, we we're able to deploy that knowledge uh, more generally. But where, where we're going to end up in, in Lanarkshire, I, I live in Lanarkshire um, and represent Lanarkshire, as, as, as does the convener. Um, 
you know, you, you said it's to do with medical appointment letters. It, well, it surely has to be more than just a letter arriving in your inbox. So, so you, no, you're, you're, you're right, and it, and it will, will be more than a letter. So it will also include information um, to allow the collection of information ahead of the appointment, which otherwise might be done at the point of appointment. It'll give additional information about the person, and it also then becomes the mechanism by which you get the response and the outcome of the appointment. But, but you know, generally in digital, um, the experience has been when you decide to start with the whole story, things go badly wrong. But when you start with a component of a service and begin and build out from that, things tend to work well. That, that's a design principle for digital services, is that you might have the whole objective in view, but you start with a particular use case and build out, because that allows you to do and, and to you know, take the technical development and the design development in a way which is more likely to be successful, and to not have me or <coughs> colleagues back here explaining why we've you know, made a mess of something. Okay. Um, Mr. Wallace, I'm going to turn to you because um, lots of people, most people, have contact with, with their councils. Um, and councils are now moving more and more to offering uh, online services. But there were some comments in the, in the report that I just want to put to you. Um, in Exhibit 2, uh, which the Deputy Convener referred to earlier, um, we, we have a comment where people find it difficult to apply for council tax reductions as some councils have moved the application process online. So if you're not online or if you struggle to use the internet, you're finding it difficult. Um, parents and carers can find it difficult to use digital apps now commonly required to support their child's education. Uh, and then if we turn to uh, paragraph 54, um, increased digitalization of customer services can provide opportunities for people to use self-service options for routine tasks. However, poorly planned digital services can disadvantage vulnerable people. Some council services that citizens frequently, frequently find difficult to access include the Blue Badge Scheme, Council House Adaptations, and cost of living support and guidance. I mean, get, would you accept all that? I, I do accept it, yeah. I think that there's more to be done in that space, and we have um, had a digital identity um, provider or, or um, proposition since 2014 with improvement service called My Account, which accesses the digital services online. There's still routes to get to you know people that don't have digital means or skills or confidence to get access to the stuff offline. I know from personal experience with my parents um, how difficult that is. Um, my mum passed away and had a funeral last week, and my dad right. has been using the Tell Me Once uh, facility with myself on Tuesday night to go through right. all the stuff to go back, including blue badge pieces. So I know firsthand how difficult it can be at times, but there is still routes to market to speak to a council on the phone through a contact centre or go into a council building. I think we have, you know, Yes, we want to put people more digitally enabled, 100%, because it saves cost, it saves time, helps with data, but we cannot marginalise the people that, 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 that don't have access. So we certainly look at that in not obviously contributing human rights, but also giving everybody fair access to all services that we provide. Um, I'm really sorry for your loss, but how, how did that work for you, using the Tell Me Once? It was, it was pretty interesting, um, actually, and it was quite easy to do because we were able to put in all my mum's details, and then within a couple of clicks, we, you know, my dad is 77, my mum was 72, with complex conditions, and my, my dad was kind of apprehensive of doing it on his own. Mm. So sitting down with a family member, um, i.e. The, the digital person in the room, um, was to try and help him through it, but within about 10 minutes we had everything done, which okay. was just a, it, it was just easy to do. Much if, easy you, to. if you hadn't been there... Yep. Um, would, the, would he have struggled, do you think? He would have struggled. Yeah. I think he would have, you know, there's access through, when, when you register the death, you get access to phone somebody to do it with you on the phone, or you can do it online as well, but my dad preferred to do it online um, because he's got the asset. Yeah. And did your parents um, in general, sorry, I'm, pick, I'm, no, no, I'm fine, just fine. mentioning your parents because yeah, okay. they're in their 70s. Yeah. Um, but did, they, did they use um, council services online? generally they try to, they um, to. so they right. use some they didn't use all right so there's some things they didn't use some things they didn't use i think from from let's just put the context i think from pride more than anything else don't want to, to to upset or annoy somebody with something they'd rather speak to somebody face to face yeah i'm t 
And, and I think of my own um, in-laws who have, have, have sadly passed away, but they never were never online. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how they managed, but they were never yep. ever online. But somehow got by, and yep. there must be a, a, a number of people in in that position. Yep. And I mean, Mr. Mr. Beatty mentioned it earlier. You either don't want to be online, um, or just can't can't get online. Yep. So for council services, it's really important, isn't it, yep. that you cater for those people? Ab absolutely, hundred percent. I think the challenge is obviously with. Post-COVID, say facilities, costs, etc. We need to look at the best place of where to put these services for the, the individual. So going back to Mr. Beatty's point about finding where the individuals are, that are you know, that are digitally excluded is, is a key point of how to actually deliver services for the better for those that choose not to go online and digital. And I also just want to point out something else from from conversations earlier on, as well that every person in the UK will have a broadband line by January 27, because the industry is moving from analogue telephone services switch off to digital. And we've done a massive piece of work with health and care professionals, the digital health and care unit in the Scottish Government, um, also with the NHS uh, and others to deliver a digital telecare service, which has helped us understand a lot more about um, the challenges around about corporate tariffs, uh, sorry, um, accessible tariffs, which we have provided guidance through the telecare service providers networks across Scotland, but also delivered a cloud solution for us as service providers to get better data to help with better outcomes. But again, at the same time, we still have to not just the, the digitally excluded may not necessarily be the individual, it could also be members of staff and how to use these devices going forward as well. So there will be you know, mass connectivity happening in the next two years across the whole of the UK, not just Scotland, that has to be, has to be looked at in terms of the opportunities that can bring and also the challenges that we'll face. And the key thing is people need to know about it. Correct. You know, uh, I mean, I actually recently got fibre broadband connection, uh, but I only did it because a bloke turned up in my street, yep. asked me to move my car uh, um, and uh, so he could get a a access to uh, a cable for a neighbour. Uh, and he said, oh, well, I just happened to notice uh, you, you haven't got it. So I, I went and got it. <laughs> so I just think it probably needs to be better advertised. Yep. Um, I was just thinking, uh, I wonder has COSLA done any kind of audit um, of what, what services councils are offering online uh, and what they, what they do for people who can't get online? Not necessarily because of the improvement service, who one of the digital partners and the digital partnership have done. And as I say, they have developed a, an ID solution called um, um, uh, My Account, and they've had other services in the back of that, such as um, uh, Parents Portal. They've done work with My Diabetes My Way. They've done work with NHS 24 for, for access to those services as well. So there's a whole lot of work that improvement services have certainly got in terms of that service challenge and service in, and issues that need to be looked at part of um, public sector transformation as too. Okay. Okay, um, we're about to enter the final uh, uh, stretch of uh, this morning's session. Can I just go back and, and get some clarification on something which came up in the evidence session that we had with the Auditor General and the Accounts Commission? And that is on this issue of the blue badge, because it's highlighted in the report has been almost emblematic of where there might be an issue around digital exclusion. And uh, in uh, answer to a question I think I put to the Auditor General, he, sa he said it feels that there is a contradiction between the population that is likely to need access, uh, uh, needs to access that service, and the mechanism through which they are required to do that by public services. Um, and when I look at the Verity House Agreement, one of the three major pillars of that is about person-centred public services. So this is a kind of test of that, isn't it? So I don't know whether, Martin, was whether you want to come, come back on that. So there's been, um, under Verity House, there's also another big piece of work just now between Solace, Society of Local Authority Chief Execs, an improvement service called Council of the Future. Part of that has got a sub-pathway on digital services. And one thing that has been picked up is the blue badge process, because it can be cumbersome online, depending on how you go through it. it has to be easier, 100%, also being offline too, but I think we have to maybe look at a different service where it's automatic entitlement. We've certainly done it for free school meals, for, for vouchers, for uh, uniforms and clothing, etc., clothing grants, etc. So I think we have to remove the stigma of actually having to apply and actually look at how do we use um, intelligent automation, AI, and the data from our council services to actually predict when somebody needs that blue badge 
and other services available, almost like being served up an advert if you're going to Amazon to buy something. People who've got this may also be interested in this and that as well. So there's a big piece of work actually underway at this at the moment. There's been a discovery done within about three months in terms of the challenges around about that. And the next phase, which is not me, it's Improvement Service doing that, are looking at at this moment in time. Th thanks. That, that clarification is uh, very helpful. And we may come back to you to check on the progress of no that problem. work. Uh, I'm now going to turn to uh, James Dornan, who... Um, uh, joins us online to prove that our uh, technology is working. So, uh, James, I'm going to pass over to you. I was tempted to pretend it wasn't working, but the the reality is it's working fine. It's, I'm very interested to hear that last bit about blue badge because my partner has one and we found it very difficult to get that sorted. So anything that's going to improve that would be would be very good news. I, I want to talk about sharing good practice around digital inclusion. And I, I know that, uh, Leslie Fraser, you, you mentioned earlier um, that subject. But could somebody tell me how does good practice currently be shared and how can you improve better collaborative working and coordination across the government? For example, the Near Me and Social Security Scotland, how are the examples from there being shared uh, across uh, the other departments. Well, thank you very much. Um, I think that's uh, really the, um, a, an important stimulus for the Digital Inclusion Alliance work um, that we are uh, coordinating. So that involves ourselves, uh, local government partners, third sector and the private sector um, as well. Um, and really thinking about um, what we can coordinate and um, the ways in which we can work um, together that will have the, the biggest impact. But Ailey, maybe I come to you just to talk a bit more <coughs> about how we do that. Thanks. Absolutely, Leslie. So as Leslie mentioned, the Digital Inclusion Alliance is an important hub of that. One of the things that we've already got up and running is a community of practice in terms of learning and sharing knowledge. And we've held several sessions over a period of months where we've invited in um, not just a government or local authority, but also third sector um, experts in this area to share their good practice. And examples of that would be, for example, the Simon community, more collective, um, and, and even into the library services through Scottish Library and um, Information Consortium. Um, internally, in the Connecting Scotland programme, we have been doing a policy mapping exercise to understand across Scottish government which policies and which strategies are um, likely to have a digital inclusion strand, so then we can bring the knowledge that we have as a team into that space to support the delivery in there. We also <coughs> are, as a team, in the Connecting Scotland team, we work alongside Digital Inclusion and Digital Lifeline colleagues and indeed there is always Connecting Scotland representation on their governance boards. So we are keeping not only our knowledge up to date, but we're able to use that connection then for us to feed out that knowledge into a wider community. Can I ask just further to that? You mentioned the private and third sector there. To what extent uh, are you partnering with them? Can you give us some examples of how they've learned from you, but also maybe how you've learned from them? Absolutely. So. Um, in the third sector, I would highlight particularly SCVO's contribution in this space. They are our key delivery partner, indeed were um, fundamental to the delivery of the 60,000 plus devices during the pandemic. They were already experts in digital inclusion and we have learned a lot through them about um, good approaches to take, particularly around about place-based design, about using a digital champion network to support people in their own area to enable them to connect in a way that feels um, important but also comfortable for that person. So that has been really key to our learning and, and development of where we got to with our full business case but also our subsequent actions. Um, the private sector has been um, really helpful. I would call out the example here of, for example, Standard Life Phoenix Group who recently um, kindly helped with the relaunch of the Digital Inclusion Charter for Scotland. Um, they are actually doing a lot with their own staff around about um, making sure their staff have awareness of digital inclusion. And the result of that has been is that when somebody phones Standard Life or Phoenix Group for support or help, the person on the phone can talk them through not only what they need to do, what they can do behind their screen, but they can also see what the person sees on an app or, a, or a, through a portal, a web portal, and can help them manoeuvre through that. And that's really important because that awareness in, in public service and also customer service in the private sector is really important to helping develop the empathy for those who are no, not on, currently online. Yeah, uh, and now that's two examples you've given me of how uh, good practice from the private and third sector 
has benefited the public sector. What about the other way around? Is there examples from the public sector that you have seen particularly uh, benefit the third sector? Um, I would call out some of the examples that were used in the Audit Scotland report, particularly around about digital lifelines and digital inclusion. Um, the digital lifelines programme in particular and the work that um, they were doing with people who were users of drugs or in recovery from use of drugs was quite <coughs> um, quite different to anything that we'd seen before and was um, very interesting in terms of the results that brought out. And particularly, um, like I say, partners like Simon Community and Digital Lifelines have worked really closely together. And so there's been a sharing back and forth of that knowledge. Um, I would also say that... Um, the Scottish Government, in terms of its position in digital inclusion, well, I, well, you know, with the recommendations of the report in front of us, is actually seen as a leader in the UK in terms of the progress we have made in digital inclusion, um, not only because of the funding and the position from the pandemic of giving out, um, gifting devices and connectivity and skills support to people, but also because of the learning we've taken and how we've brought that back in and shared that outwards again, um, not only in Scotland, but also with other administrations around the UK. I wonder, just the, the last question I'd like to ask is, how uh, is awareness raised about uh, you know, service design tools and other methods to support the digital inclusion, such as social tariffs and developing the minimum digital living standard? Um, so... It, from my team's perspective, we use the service design principles in developing any policy direction or indeed delivery option that we would have. So when we've been um, considering whether um, <coughs> it was the right thing to do to bring in a minimum digital living standard for Scotland and do that research um, with the universities of Liverpool, Loughborough and Glasgow, we applied service principles to that to make sure that we were um, outcome focused, that we were user led, to make sure that we were then going to use the appropriate data, all of these really important things. Um, as Jeff has mentioned, the service design principles are there for the public sector to use and, and they should be followed. So whenever anybody is looking at a digital inclusion programme, they should be following those service principles and designing it anyway. The value add that we will bring with the minimum digital living standard is to bring extra um, guidance and advice to those service standards so that it becomes much more prominent in people's minds as they deliver uh, in that way. And the... And the potential is for you to continue to share that knowledge Absolutely. with the private and the third sector to make sure everybody benefits from it, yeah? Absolutely. Right, OK. OK, right, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, we've got time for one final question, and uh, I'm going to award that to the Deputy Convener, Jamie. Oh, I'm going to have to choose between the two that I had shortlisted then. That's fine. Um, can I ask about rural uh, connectivity? Um, I think it's an important area. Um, particularly with relevance to Scotland. Can I ask for... The, the, the report specifically hones in on it in the whole section, particularly around paragraph 21, around coverage in urban areas versus rural areas. Um, off the back of, of what you said, Jeff, really, I appreciate that. Getting to that last couple of percent of people is always the most difficult and often the most expensive as well from a technical, physical, logistical point of view. Um, but I'm aware of... of government schemes, uh, both the Scottish Government across the UK and in the private sector. There's lots of activity taking place around things like the, the broadband voucher scheme and the shared rural network and so on. I wonder if you could just give, give me an update as to the progress on that and when you think you might actually hit, hit that 100 to ensure that rural communities have just as good access to 4G and broadband <coughs> as urban communities and cities do. So, so um, as I said earlier, we've, we've made significant progress, a big step in that certainly was during 23 when we put in 16 undersea cables you know across the the north effectively um, and on the basis of those cables going in we're now doing the build out of the in you know the broadband infrastructure across the islands uh, and in some cases the, the number of people on those islands is pretty small so we've we've, we've managed to take take that a, a fairly long way Beyond that, um, we're working closely with the UK government on the gigabit scheme, and particularly on you know, what's described, if I recall correctly, as Lot C, which is basically after you do the larger geographic um, tranches of, the, of, of, of Scotland, um, that it takes you to everything else that's left behind that hasn't fallen into one of those. And we're, 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 we're actually meeting with UK government colleagues this afternoon on effectively how we approach that, because previously they had set, um, under the previous government, they'd set a, effectively a price cap on, on um, 
particular properties, um, which was significantly below what we estimated it would actually take us to actually reach uh, 100%. So we, we, th we think that there's, we're expecting a, a degree of flexibility on, on that. Um, as I said also earlier, we are you know, also considering and have been looking at issues in respect of low Earth orbit satellites, which has certainly improved. And again, over the next period of time, we're going to see additional networks over and above the Starlink network up here um, over Scotland. You know, we're aware that uh, the Kuiper network um, begins to roll out, has begun to roll out, and you know, during 25 will extend um, certainly across a large area of Scotland. And again, that gives a, another option as to how we can actually meet that. So I, th I think we are looking probably at s somewhere between 27 and maybe towards the end of 28, just in terms of when we reach 100% um, um, of, of connectivity. But um, we're pretty close, and it, we are getting to that point where it is, it is now coming down to sort of groups of property and individual properties across the country. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. I'm afraid we have run out of time, so uh, I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to thank our witnesses this morning, uh, Leslie Fraser, Jeff Huggins, Aileen McLaughlin and Martin Wallace. Thank you all for uh, the evidence that you've given us uh, and uh, the response that you've given uh, to the Audit uh, Scotland Accounts Commission report into tackling digital exclusion. Uh, we will consider what our next steps uh, are, but um, for the time being, uh, can I thank you again, uh, and I'll move this morning's committee meeting into private session.